Thanks for joining us. Welcome to this roundtable on the most common security mistakes in voice networks from ECG. Uh, we've been doing security audits and assessments and engineering improvement for service providers, enterprises and public sector government networks for over 15 years. Uh, and that's specifically on voice networks. A lot of us have been doing security in internet service provider domains for well over 20 years webinar to talk about some of the interesting things that we've uh, seen lately and that are uh, that happen a lot so we we're packaging our assessment and audit and engineering support in a in a new way uh, it's the a lot of the same expertise but it's packaged to give you continuous eyes on your network it's we call it the cybersecurity assessment and defense or CSAN service and uh, it gives you ongoing assessments uh, and monitoring against vulnerabilities and it's tailored to your network so different networks um, are going to get a different package uh, focused on um, specifically what they're running right. in that network. And so that's what CSAN does. It gives an ongoing continuous assessment of different elements of your network. So instead of just having that one um, annual audit or something like that, where you, you go to all that effort to, to look through all the details, this is a continuous repeated thing because, you know, these configuration settings, these vulnerabilities, they change over time. So my name is Mark Lindsay. I'm your host today. I'm one of the senior members of technical staff here at ECG. And uh, today, as we've got uh, a lot of people here with us, uh, we're going to get started on um, and going over some of the fundamentals um, for security in unified communication voice and video networks. So generally speaking, voice networks with video capabilities or UC networks uh, writ large. So we're going to start with James Puckett. He's, uh, he founded ECG in 2001. He's a senior member of technical staff. Uh, his projects just this week have been on large network combining uh, contact centers, research, yeah. academics, healthcare, business, all kinds of things go into this, into this one complex network. Um, he's done security projects with the, the tiniest service providers all the way up to the federal government, uh, networks that are being continuously uh, attacked and, and being able to comply with uh, different uh, standards for uh, all of those different kinds of networks. So he's going to start us off with a few of the security fundamentals. So James, uh, what are some of the security fundamentals you'd like to share with us? So, you know, the, the first one that I wanted to uh, just sort of chat about, you, you think about um, uh, how, how, do you, how do you evaluate uh, your network? And different companies evaluate uh, uh, their networks uh, uh, using different metric, metrics, different rubrics. Um, so I, th I think sort of the first one that, that I wanted to bring up was, are you using... Um, some sort of uh, security framework, cyber security framework um, specifically. Um, I really don't care uh, which one you do use um, as long as it's uh, uh, robust and, and thorough. Some examples, ISO has uh, several different security frameworks. I personally prefer the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, but it, it's not enough to just sort of have declared that you have a cybersecurity uh, uh, framework. Um, and you've read over it and you understand what that cybersecurity framework is asking uh, of you and of your organization. I, I think uh, you, you also have to make sure that you're training your people on the cybersecurity framework from uh, at, at really from the, from the very top all the way to the, to the, to the, uh, you know, to the, the standard office worker. Now, now obviously the office standard office worker doesn't need to know um, quite as much about the the fundamentals of security as 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 say you know senior architects and 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 the like, but um, it, it's important that your that your people have um, training uh, so that they can uh, so that they can be attentive to the things that that you need them to be attentive to, um, and so uh, I think training is fundamental. Um, it, it, it is. It doesn't matter to me whether the training is internal or, or external training. Um, lots of different organizations um, provide uh, training, both, uh, both live as well as recorded. Um, you can have customized training. You can have just sort of standard stock training. All of that is, um, uh, brings value, um, and I'll leave you to sort of evaluate that. Um, 
to me, though, the, the, the training is only value if, the, if there's a real test at the end. You've got you've to sort of make sure that once, the, once you've sort of decided on a cybersecurity framework and you've done your training on your cybersecurity framework, um, that, you're, that you're testing to make sure that the people that need to know and understand that framework um, do know and understand that framework. And the only way to know that is uh, is to uh, to make sure that they've they've tested um, again whether it's internal testing external testing it is is not really I'm not pitching any particular approach um, but but uh, making sure that you've selected a cybersecurity framework that you've trained on it and that you're testing at the end I think is sort of the first thing that we wanted to uh, sort of mention as as the type of thing that we would. Um, you know, uh, uh, cover here. I'm going to sort of go through some some other thoughts fairly uh, fairly quickly. But SIP authentication. Uh, you know, this this webinar, this uh, this roundtable is focused on voice networks, um, and and we deal a lot with um, authentication of endpoints, authentication of devices, um, and I think SIP authentication is one that we really need to um, you know be uh, be attentive to. Uh, defending your devices uh, and your phones against scanning. Um, internally, externally, um, uh, the device thems themselves as well as device configurations, all of those things are, uh, are things that we need to be attentive to. Um, and, and, you know, I think, I think lastly, um, uh, as, as far as uh, sort of the introduction, I think the, the, we need to make sure um, as organizations that we have somebody on our team that understands all aspects of your network and, and, and how those systems integrate. Um, it's, not that, it's not that you have to have one person that understands um, everything and sort of does everything, but that, that you have people that understand um, the, their piece and how it interfaces with the, with the other pieces and that together you have a full understanding of the network. I, I, we run into a lot of different um, potential customers, customer service providers that, um, you know, they've, they've got folks on staff and they're, they're good people, um, but they don't endeavor to understand all of the network. They're, they're um, satisfied to, to be involved with just their piece and that siloing sort of causes, uh, causes some angst. So I think, uh, lastly, sort of a, a, a complete understanding, uh, having people on your team, whether they be whether they be team members or external consultants, or but somebody that you can uh, have as a resource that it fully understands uh, your network and and uh, and how the various components integrate with one another. So that's sort of the last the uh, the last item that I wanted to just sort of introduce as a as a thought point. Um, before uh, before we uh, dig into it in a little bit more detail. Yeah, thanks, James. Those are those are really good uh, and fundamental. Uh, so Sherwin Crown is an, also a member, a senior member of technical staff here at ECG. Uh, he's currently working on projects in one of the largest uh, UCAS providers based here in the United States. Um, he's got a master's in computer science with a focus on computer security. So he's got the really strong academic creds uh, in this space. Uh, so, Sherwin, what are some of the fundamentals that you uh, would like to introduce us to today? The first thing we can talk about is um, the common one, it, which is uh, voicemail portal security. Um, there are still a lot of service providers out there that are not really taking that seriously, or if they, and that, if they um, enable some sort of voicemail portal security, they're not really enforcing it on all the customer base. Um, there's always exceptions to the rule. And these exceptions leave, leave them open for vulnerabilities. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the ones that I see most common. Um, in addition to that, they have um, issues with um, maximum number of concurrent calls per user. And so what we see here is that um, if you're not setting your maximum number of concurrent calls, either at the system level, service provider level, group level, or user level, and once that user is compromised, then, you know, attackers can just pump as many calls as they want through the network. Um, and so having an understanding or having a real security policy in place on what your limits are uh, per customer type, then uh, that can definitely help a lot into what we're, what we're dealing with here. 
Um, another common um, mistake that I that I see on the network is the um, the E164 dial plan. So a lot of folks spend a lot of time in the NADP dial plans for call typing, and they're they're introducing all sorts of blocking features based on call types. And so um, one of the things that um, service providers usually miss is that the E164 dial plan is usually treated differently than the, the regular NADP dial plan. And so um, having whatever policy you're planning on enforcing needs to make sure that you're enforcing it in, in all your dial plans on your platform so that your calls can be typed properly and um, your security policies are enforced. Um, so I think that's another one that I, that I tend to see a lot. Um, the other one is um, basically reviewing the operating system and platform modules for upgrade patching. Um, a lot of folks don't tend to like to patch because that creates a lot of work, a lot of headache, and a lot of testing. Um, however, to keep your stuff up to date, you, need, you definitely need to patch it. And so, um, although you do have to do a lot of prep work uh, to do the patching and the testing and to make sure everything is, is fine after, after you've done this, you still need to enforce the patching cycles to keep up with security. Um, a lot of folks tend to, neg to neglect that and push it as far as possible or just pick certain feature patches that they need to make something work and ignore all the rest of them for as long as possible. Um, and then lastly, um, which this one I've, I've, I've ran into recently is, is how do you actually obsolete um, or end of life obsolete devices, right? So you're trying to enforce new security policies, but your old devices don't support these new policies. Um, you know, therefore you can't enforce your new security policy. Um, so without coming up with all sorts of hacks that leaves you open to the same security holes that you're trying to negate in the first place. Um, so they, they have to have some sort of plan in place of deprecating obsolete devices that no longer support the protocols, um, the future protocols that you're trying to use. Um, I think off the top, those are the ones that um, that I think is, are, are the ones that I would bring up here. Great, yeah, thanks Sherwin. Those are really uh, key, important as well. Uh, so thanks for those, those insights. Brian Tate is another senior member of technical staff here at ECG. Uh, he's recently been doing projects in a public sector voice network where security is always a top priority. Um, he has a background in a diverse set of fields, including uh, data transmission, routing and switching is kind of a particular focus and specialty area. So uh, when I'm talking about uh, routing protocols and particularly thorny, thorny problems there, then I, you know, Brian's the guy I, uh, I like to go to. So Brian, uh, what are some of the security fundamentals that you want to uh, bring us uh, to us today? The first of the, the ideas that, that really come to mind when I think of cybersecurity is the, the passwords. So and passwords, I want to use it as a general term, not just um, something that you use with your user account to type into a web interface, but passwords are everywhere. And they may be secrets that could be a passcode, so they may actually be numeric, um, but just the awareness of the fact that there's all sorts of these passwords out there in your systems. Some of them you may use as a user, some may you only, may only use as an admin, and yet there's some that not even admins are aware of and we run into that on a regular basis. And so being able to handle those passwords responsibly really can help mitigate uh, the threat of an attack, especially when there's, there's passwords you don't know about get leaked out through a, a denial of service or brute force attack, or just uh, good intentioned um, system management policies. And we'll talk about one of those here in just a moment. But uh, it's, it's important that you make sure the, the policies and the strategies that you have in, in the company get carried out throughout. Um, there's different strategies in terms of man, maintaining the secrecy of the passwords and also things that you can do to make sure that if a password were to get out, there's ways to uh, minimize the impact that may have on your business, uh, especially your user services. So definitely ask the question, are the password policies really being followed everywhere? And do we think through it and periodically evaluate those? Um, a second thing that I think about would be the exposure of individual server components to the internet. So there's lots of different security border elements out there now. It's not just firewalls and firewall means a lot of different things now. So really considering where you put your firewalls in place. Are they handling real-time data? 
Are they handling non-real-time data? Are they providing you a load balancing facility? Um, and are your servers themselves um, unnecessarily opened up to attacks on software that you don't even know is on the server? So thinking through those things and having those things periodically evaluated really does protect you. And we've seen that with uh, several of our customers. Um, another area is, and, and this is true to my background, as Mark said, is, is the network segmentation. So I kind of came up the OSI stack from the bottom. So I am, uh, software engineering is, 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 is newer in my career than the ones and zeros and the, the transmission and trans, transport networking. So this is near and dear to me is how do you protect the network um, so that you don't have threats come in and attack the systems and the servers and the software that live on that network. And there's a lot of different things that you can do now beyond firewalls, beyond the actual um, security elements to safeguard and to keep the traffic that doesn't need to be in a certain area out of that area. And that can help you if you do run into an attack, it prevents the distribution of malware um, beyond certain borders. So separating the LAN from the core of your video and voice um, infrastructure in the core is important. Um, there's also insider attacks that you can protect against using creative network technologies for monitoring as well as um, locking things down. So the last thing I want to mention going back to uh, earlier when I talked about passwords is one of the things that passwords can get leaked out in is, well, how are you backing up your data? Is one uh, system policy uh, making you vulnerable to, in another way? So when you do backups, what are you backing up? And if you're backing up sensitive information, how do you protect the sensitive information without overly complicating the, the disaster recovery or the restoration processes? So periodically evaluating and having a, a well comprehensive thought through backup plan is critical to, to business these days. Knowing where and how often the, the, the data is backed up, um, have it validated in terms of, is it still good data? Because there's no sense in keeping a database uh, from, from year, years ago. And we do see customers that because they haven't thought through it, they end up keeping backup copies of backup copies of backup copies of data that's never going to do them any good. And so looking at that periodically and having that reviewed by a, a third party can be very helpful because you get out of the maintain the idea of, oh, well, we just need to gather data and gather data and store it. But it's really not protecting you because when the disaster happens, and they do, the contingency plan is no good if you don't know how to use the data that you have. And so you're you're unarchiving and unzipping this and unzipping that, and it creates more problems than, than you had in the begin with. So take a good look at the backups and how you store sensitive data like audit logs that may record attacks so that that data is backed up and not itself susceptible to attack. And going back to the passwords and configuration, provisioning data. And then there's some data that's near real time that you need to have backed up, and that's separate. So keep all those things in mind. Yeah, th those are really good. And in fact, several, um, several of those are related to some of the incidents in the news lately where some big organizations uh, suffered cybersecurity attacks and it kind of came down to these kinds of, uh, the problems of, of this nature where they didn't have adequate segmentation or their backup policy. They had a lot of copies of data, but they weren't really ready for restore when they needed to be. So those are those are uh, really important, uh, Brian. So we're going to turn next to John Claybone. He's our newest senior member of technical staff. Uh, he's been focused lately on uh, one of the world's largest uh, networks, voice networks, and specifically two of the leading session border controller vendors deployed in that network and, and how to, uh, and uh, customer migrations between those. Uh, so John, what fundamentals would you like to introduce us to? Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Uh, first, I want to ask the question: uh, Do you do you ever do scanning of your own network? Do you ever scan the internet accessible interfaces that you have in your network? Um, the idea here being to make sure that you don't have any holes in your firewall policies that you wouldn't know about otherwise. Um, it's okay to and good to review your firewall policies, but uh, doing the actual scanning can often be really really helpful to uncover things that you can miss otherwise. 
Um, how, how often do you fire up Netcat and, and scan your own network? Um, do you ever, related to this is, do you ever do internal or external security audits? Um, do you ever put on that hat and, and really get in deep on what uh, your overall security as an organization looks like? Um, and the interesting thing about these three is that they're actually, uh, they're not VoIP specific, but I really see so many VoIP service providers missing these that are, are really just uh, uh, applicable to all, uh, all networks, all uh, information security systems. Um, and so then the next one is thinking about is security part of your change management process? Um, is this part of how you go about making changes in your network routinely, but then also is it part of your process if, there, if something's broken and you have an outage and you need to fix it? Uh, so after, uh, after an outage or after a change is made to resolve an issue, are you going back and are you looking at that change that was made to see not only functionality wise, but also security wise, did it leave you open to exploits that you previously had covered? Uh, and then last, uh, to kind of tag on with what Brian was talking about with uh, backup and restore policies, um, are they written? Are they uh, understandable to, uh, to your staff um, on the, uh, specifically the backup and restore side? Then also add in disaster recovery plans as well. What elements of your network will recover automatically from some kind of disaster and which elements will need manual intervention uh, in order to recover? I mean, we're talking very, very large events here. Um, do you have a plan for some of those very, very large events? Uh, and then also uh, an idea of a continuity of operations action plan as well. That, that also includes people as well. Do you have plans for uh, what will happen if uh, certain, uh, certain members of your team are not available? Uh, to do the work. And right along with that is, do you ever test these policies? Um, nobody really cares how tidy your backup is. What you really care about is how quickly and completely you can get up and running again. And without testing these things, you really have no idea if it's going to work. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for those, John. Um, so these these fundamentals, we've we've gone through them in about you know 20 minutes, but and they're really a lot of work to maintain. Um, ECG as a as an organization, we've been putting together security criteria that we use in the audits of networks. Uh, some of you guys who are here have had some of our security audit work before, and and that's what the CSAN is built on the security cybersecurity um, assessment and defense services. It's based on using those security criteria that are a lot of them spring out of these items that we just went through and apply them on a, on a routine, consistent basis in a way that doesn't interfere with you doing their, your, their, your main job um, and then giving you feedback um, on what you can uh, do, how you can improve what needs to be done, and then coming back and checking to be sure that the, the good measures that you put in place are, are still in place. So um, now that we've talked through a lot of these fundamentals, um, I wanna let each of the panelists cover uh, some of the items that they think of as um, the most common mistake, the most kind of grave or kind of important mistake that they're seeing in voice uh, networks. And we're gonna go back and start with um, James Puckett on uh, what he sees as the most common important mistake that he, uh, he comes across. So, so the, 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 the most common mistake that I see in voice network security, it's actually a very, um, uh, large umbrella uh, type uh, type mistake. It's it's not a uh, it's not a it's it's not something that can be fixed uh, quickly with a keyboard or anything like that. It's it's a failure of, of imagination. Um, it's a failure of imagination to imagine your network at scale. Um, you know, we, we, we see a lot, there's, there's a couple of uh, very simple examples and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, mention those, but the, um, you know, we, when we start out with these networks, um, the networks that we operate, a, a lot of them will get built from scratch uh, exactly once. Um, and a lot of them started as relatively small um, operations, especially especially if you've been wildly successful. Um, 
you know, there's been a lot of mergers and acquisitions. There's uh, been huge growth in the VoIP industry. Um, and so, you know, th these, these small operations sometimes, um, when they're great, you know, wildly successful, turn into large operations. So I think failure to imagine your network at scale is, is sort of the, the most common um, one that I run into. And that it sort of um, uh, manifests itself in a lot of different ways. Just a, an example would be, you know, you, you, you start out, um, and, and this is, you know, for large service providers, this sounds, you know, uh, sort of humorous. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't have that problem here um, uh, sort of thing. But, you know, if you, when you were, when you were babies, you know, five, 10, 15 years ago is when, when your companies were started or, or when your company, if you're an enterprise, when you first got into doing uh, voice over IP, certainly a fair amount of thought was probably um, put into the cost associated with deploying handsets. Um, you know, it's, it's non-trivial to, uh, you know, get a, get a handset from the manufacturer, um, you know, get the provisioning information out of the individual handsets and associate it with an individual user, um, and then sort of put that thing on the, on the desk and maintain security all the way through, um, knowing exactly which handset is going to exa represent exactly which uh, end user and so on and so forth. Um, but a fair amount of thoughts given to uh, these sorts of things. And, um, and, and sometimes we make the decision that we're going we're gonna to do all that's necessary in order to have these things be, um, have these things be as, secure, as secure as we make them. Sometimes um, we sacrifice the security in, uh, in favor of um, ease of use. So an example might be manually configured devices um, that are, you know, pl placed out because, you know, historically, if you were a, uh, maybe if you were a, a, um, an integrator or you had an integrator that was placing phones um, manually, they were going out providing white glove service. They might, uh, they might you know, touch each and every phone um, polish it before they hand it over to the customer, make sure the buttons all had the speed dials on them that they wanted and so on and so forth. And then they walk away and the customer ends up with a fantastic experience, thrilled to death with, with, uh, with what they've, with, with what they've received. But the, you, what you, you know, potentially um, left with was a, a manually configured uh, device. Um, and those manually configured devices, I think Sherwin mentioned in, in his intro um, about, you know, end of life devices and, and, uh, and, and those sorts of things. Well, you know, long before we decide to end of life these devices, there'll be multiple opportunities to upgrade these devices. And if they're manually configured and they're not talking to a centralized provisioning server, then, you know, that's, that's bad. Um, if they are talking to a centralized provisioning server, but they're not using um, password security for the configuration files um, that are secure enough and you know different people have different opinions on exactly what secure enough is. Is it secure enough if all of the devices within the group share the same password or, or you know all of the devices use a non-default password or does every device have to have its own individual password? There's a lot of different uh, uh, feelings on that and I think um, scale um, and deployment mechanisms and sec edge security devices will impact a lot of those decisions that are made. But whatever, wherever you sort of end up on the scale, um, it's, you know, it, the, the risk is that you end up on the scale, the end of the scale where, no, we're just going to place this thing down. It's going to, you know, it's really, really simple to, um, to place the device, have it use the default username and password, reach, you know, reach back out to the, to the server, get its config. It's going to be great. Um, you know, we can ship thousands of these things a week and turn them up. Um, you know, when we're big boys, we'll come back and, and, uh, and figure out how to, uh, figure out how, to, you know, get these things under control. Um, you know, so there's, a, there's a lot of different things that, uh, that sort of, uh, cascade, um, and cause, uh, security ripples, um, due to, um, you know, a f the failure to imagine your network at scale. I, I said in, at the beginning um, of my, you know, of this, this section that I felt like, um, 
you know, a lot of networks get, you know, sort of one opportunity to be built um, from scratch. And, and, and certainly, you know, folks that have been doing this a while, um, you know, know that that, that, that that in and of itself is a little bit naive. Just because we did not, uh, we were not imaginative enough, we never imagined that we were going to have 50,000 subscribers, or we never imagined we were going to have 100,000 subscribers, or we never imagined we were going to have a million subscribers way back when, doesn't mean that we have to give up on imagining now where we're at and figuring out how to get from where we were when we were more naive to where we, you know, to where we need to be from a security perspective. But that failure to imagine your network at scale, I think, um, is the root of some of those issues. I'll, I'll follow on there. I agree with all that. I'll follow on um, that. Uh, so that's, that's the imagining at scale. And then there's also an element of how, what's the depth and what's the effectiveness or what's the completeness of the security measures that we are putting in place. Uh, I think that, I think that we can often implement the, the quick and easy changes, you know, the ones that, that they make us feel nice and warm and fuzzy. Like we're, like we're doing security or we're, we're at least doing something. It's, it's something that we can, put on a progress report to our management. But oftentimes those things can give us a, a false sense of security. Um, uh, an example of this would be blocking invites in our SPC that have the SIP user agent of a friendly scanner. Um, it's, it's really child's play for the attackers to just change the SIP header that they're sending to us. And so that, that immediately becomes an ineffective security measure. Um, and then it starts to put you in an impossible game of whack-a-mole as the uh, attackers are changing their uh, their user agent header. So instead, more completely would be to implement SIP authentication or invite authentication or implementing rules to block repeated offenders um, to prevent denial of service, et cetera. I think the, to sort of put a put a period on this, you know, I said, you know, failure to imagine your network at scale. Um, and, 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 and certainly I, I believe that's true, but I think uh, failure to ima of imagination is, is sort of the, the, even the root of that. And I think that applies more to, to John's, uh, uh, to, to John's question, to his point, the, you know, when we're looking for engineering solutions to current problems, um, we don't, Need to be uh, tunnel visioned. You know, we don't need to be so focused on solving this specific issue that we can't imagine what the next, very probably very related issue is. We it, like if we block the user agent friendly scanner, we I think it's reasonable to expect that an uh, an engineer, an operator would have had the imagination to to think well probably they're not going to stick with friendly scanner for very long. So, you know, what, if any user agents, can we actually, you know, block? Now, now I get, you know, sometimes these things are, you're just trying to, you know, you know, put a tourniquet on the bleeding. You know, you just want the avalanche of registrations to stop. You want the app. So I'm not saying you never do, you know, the things, uh, you know, these, these, uh, these simple items, but I think a complete, engineering solution involves a considerable amount of imagination, not just imagining the solution to the current problem, but also imagining what the solution might look like to likely future issues. Yeah, I think a, another great example of that, this kind of concept happens when you want to add a new type of application to your network. You've got a customer, they want a particular type, maybe it's a, a call center reporting or some sort of activity reporting. It's custom to them. So you say, well, you know, they're going to support it. And so they're going to do most of the work. All I have to do is add a firewall rule. I, I have to, I can allow them through. I can, I can set up this one entry in the database to, to allow this kind of one-off because this isn't really a main product. Uh, this is something that they're doing on their own. And so you're not rolling something out. It's not even a product view. It's just an accommodation that you're making to your customer. Well, that's an example of not imagining at scale as well, because you're, you're starting to think through these exceptions. Now you may need to make exceptions like that, but I think the, the crossing, the crossover point of danger or, shows up when you stop managing it. You say, eh, it's just an exception. Let's just throw it over our, the back and, and hope, hope for the best. 
uh, versus managed exceptions where you say, no, this is, a, this is an ICB, we're gonna manage this, and, and every time we do firewall updates, every time we do database updates, we have to keep this in mind, we have to ask if the customer still needs it, maybe we need to charge them something, we need to, or at the very least, we need to plan our time around including this in the upgrade process to confirm that this thing still works. And, it, and if you're willing to sort of take ownership of the ICB exception, then you're managing it, and you can potentially keep it safe, but you're also going to be thinking in terms of, well, gosh, we can't really afford many of these ICBs. We, we can't do these little one-offs, you know, in every situation because the, it, w it would just be too expensive. We need to think about how do we scale this up and, and whether or not we want to support this in kind of a thorough uh, way going forward. So those are really good uh, thoughts um, there, I, I think. Sherwin uh, has given some thought to TLS management. Sherwin, can you, can you tell us what you're thinking about here? Uh, yeah, so for, for TLS management, one of the things that, that came to mind was um, the fact that a lot of folks are implementing uh, TLS versions and giving themselves a false sense of security because they're not even verifying that they either are using these versions or if they even turned on. Um, and um, the, other part, the other part to that equation too is that even with these versions turned on, if you're not deprecating the unsecure versions like the SSLv3 or the TLS 1.0 stuff, that, that's, that's deemed to be um, of a lower level of security, then there's still applications out there that can select this um, because you didn't do anything about it. Um, so one of the, one of the situations that, that I've seen of late is, um, you know, this comes back to um, service providers having a lot of obsolete equipment out there. And so, you know, you go through the whole process of rolling out um, newer the brand new updated TLS versions and Cypher suites and, and all this stuff that, 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 that's happening out there in the field. And, you know, you go to management and say, look, I, I can do a scan and it says TLS 1.2 right here. Everything is fine. Everybody is doing this. And, and then you actually do TLS monitoring of device connections to your, you know, Apache or your Tomcat servers. And you notice 50% of your stuff is still using TLS 1.0. Um, so what did you really just do? Um, you, you made it a, a step of improvement by introducing TLS 1.2, but, you know, there's still more work to be done. And a lot of people are not doing the monitoring necessary to ensure that everybody's using what they're supposed to be using. Um, now, a lot of this, too, comes to play with, um, again, if you're using obsolete devices that don't support TLS 1.2 or don't have the firmware to, to upgrade possible to support TLS 1.2 or or some other mechanism, then you know discussions need to be had of do we replace these devices or or what do we have to do? Um, I've seen in the field where folks are actually turning up multiple interfaces, um, secure interfaces and non-secure interfaces, where they're trying to split these off to say, all right, so these new devices will go to the secure interfaces and and these guys will do 2LS 1.2 only to make sure that you know these guys are good. And then until we can deprecate all this stuff, um, these guys will have to stay on this this you know, this unsecure interface that's sitting over here. Um, and so I think um, a lot of things revolving around that is, is you know, I think, although it's hard, um, and although, you know, it may be some sort of expense, if you're going to enforce security, they, they will need to be, you know, some change that needs to happen. Um, I know a lot of folks don't feel like muddying the waters with the customers and don't want to have that conversation with the customers about having new, to get new devices and, and all this stuff going on here. but um, you know, if it's not supported, it's not supported. And a line needs to be drawn in the sand of, of what you're going to do. Yeah, I think sort of to follow up on that, the, you know, upgrade, I, I think the TLS 1.2 example, it's, it's one that, that we're probably everybody on this call, unless you are a brand new service provider, um, or you control not only the servers, but the client, um, you know, a la, maybe Zoom or, or, or Cisco with, with WebEx or Microsoft or somebody like that. But um, when, you have a, when you have a more open platform, you don't have control of, of necessarily both ends of the, uh, both ends of the, of the system. Then you, 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 you get into a situation where you, um, there's, there is significant pain um, to having hardware devices that are, um, that are uh, older uh, still in the network. I mean, I, I, I remember, um, you know, not that many years ago, we had, there was a, tr a transition from, uh, for 
um, for uh, key length um, for SSL certificates. And, you know, the, the, the browser uh, vendors said, okay, well, you know, we're no longer going to allow these, uh, these shorter, you know, these shorter uh, keys. You know, we, everybody's going to have to have a, tw a, a, a 1024 um, bit uh, key. And that, that, that all sounds great. You know, you, uh, the, the browser vendors say that's what's going to happen. And so then you end up going out there and you end up replacing, uh, you know, replacing these, uh, these, you get these new keys with new certificates that, uh, that are far more secure than, you know, 256 or 512 or something less. Um, the problem is, you know, you, you could run into, and we have run into, there are some old devices in a lot of different networks they just don't support 1024 bit certificates. It's just not an option. And so those devices um, uh, can, you know, fall off the network and uh, become sort of unmanaged or you can't get a certificate that these devices, you know, a, a CA signed certificate that these devices uh, will use. Um, so I think uh, management uh, sort of conscious, um, um, well-considered management of uh, sort of your security, uh, your security edge, specifically related to SSL and TLS, uh, means really thinking through um, the, the 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 devices that are that are out there that are going to be um, uh, talking to your network. Um, two other uh, sort of uh, quick thoughts. I'll try to be uh, quick. Uh, quicker because I know we've got a lot to get through, um, but the uh, it's one, uh, Sherwin sort of alluded to it in a in a quick sentence. Um, the you know we will oftentimes patch systems so that we have support for um, for for newer uh, newer TLS versions for 1.2 or that we remove certain cipher suites or so on and so forth. Um, a lot of folks use uh, Apache um, and or Tomcat. And it's not enough to just have the capability of using TLS 1.2 or the capability of uh, uh, deprecating um, uh, less secure cipher suites. Oftentimes you actually have to go in and act, and it sort of makes sense, go in and actively activate those things in these configurations. It's not enough to just upgrade to the latest version of Apache and declare success. Um, you also have to go in and 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 uh, and consider uh, consider the actual configurations. And then my last thought was, you know, Sherwin mentioned having two different, uh, maybe two different interfaces. You've got a TLS 1.2 interface. Um, I can imagine on a, an, a load balancer, you know, F5 LTM or something like that. And maybe a 1.0 uh, version. You've got two different sets of endpoints, one that talks to the 1.2, the other that talks to the 1.0. And I, th I think that's a, uh, that's a good start. It gives you flexibility of, of how you treat, uh, treat these endpoints. But I think the other, the other thing that has to be considered is the access to the resources behind the thing that's doing the 1.2 or the 1.0. If what you're trying to do is to not allow <clears throat> people to gain access to resources using inferior cipher suites and inferior uh, SSL uh, protocols, and um, but you uh, allow via either interface to actually get to the same resources on the backside, you know, device configuration files or or whatever, um, using the same passwords. I'm not sure you've done a lot other than complicate your life. So there's a lot of, you got, you really do have to think it all the way, uh, all the way through. Now, sometimes you'll again, make these, uh, make these interfaces as a transitional period intending to get rid of the 1.0 stuff and finding ways to shut that stuff down. But you really do have to, you have to think it all the way through. These are these are non-trivial things. I mean, if you're talking about, you know, one or two customers, uh, you know, endpoints, that's, those are relatively simple when you're talking about tens or hundreds of thousands of Polycom and Yealink and Cisco phones all talking to this stuff, running dozens of different versions of software. 
it becomes it becomes a sizable uh, a challenge. And so you really do have to understand and look at the client, the server, the resources, the whole thing, and sort of think through how you're going to how you're going to uh, make those transitions. But I think getting rid of the old cipher suites, getting rid of the old protocols. That's a, that's a noble goal. And I think until you've successfully accomplished that, not just this, but for all future, because uh, TLS 1.2 is not going to be the end all be all. There will be some other, you know, something, I don't know what we'll call it, but, you know, uh, in the future uh, that will need to be transitioned from uh, and you have to have a, a good, you know, migration strategy. Yeah, that's really, really good points there uh, that you're highlighting, especially I like that you're emphasizing the use of TLS as an authentication mechanism. We usually think of TLS as a protection against eavesdropping primarily. So, you know, the news stories about Zoom and their encryption has really focused on eavesdropping. Um, but you're, you pointed out, James, that we really do use TLS as an authentication tool. And so if you have basically uh, a skeleton key and then a modern key, and you're still allowing people to get into the vault using the skeleton key, then it's only as good as the skeleton key uh, when you're using that for authentication. Um, right. So very, very interesting stuff. Uh, John, you, you had some thoughts about uh, handling of sensitive data that you're, that you're con consciously working with in your operational environment. Tell us more. Yeah, so I'm, I've seen a, a surprising, very surprising lack of understanding uh, in how important it is to keep the private encryption keys private. Um, I mean, just, just one example. So uh, I was going through uh, a customer's past tickets in a vendor's trouble ticketing system looking for something for that customer. Uh, and I see the spot where the a vendor pasted in a Google Drive link. So I click on it and it was a folder with 10 or 15 of that customer's production private keys. Mm. Uh, it was publicly accessible to anyone with the link. We know that link got sent out via email. Uh, and so it, it, right there was everything you needed to listen to all of the uh, TLS encrypted phone calls on that platform. Um, and even worse, the, the customer didn't even seem to have any problem with that happening either. Um, so the frameworks that James mentioned, uh, those have pages and pages on how to manage these keys well, uh, but I'll take just a minute and touch on just a few basic uh, key management best practices, uh, storing, the encrypt the keys encrypted at rest, storing them encrypted at rest. Thinking about the physical access to where they're stored. Um, cloud service providers and file syncing may be fine for your application, but for some applications that may not be up to the task. Um, yeah, you may have to have much better physical security than that. Um, thinking about the logical uh, network access to those keys, um, what devices, what networks, um, what types of devices can access uh, where that the, those keys are stored. And then also thinking about role access. Um, not everyone in your organization should have access to the most precious secrets, um, but people still need to be able to do their job. So there, you have to really uh, evaluate that and think about that. Um, a couple of just quick ideas uh, on how to do this again, uh, there are many different uh, requirements out there, um, but password managers uh, have encrypted databases that you can uh, sync over cloud uh, services, um, going up in security even more, keeping private keys on USB sticks, maybe even air gapping the certificate authority machines that are, are generating these keys and CSRs. Um, and then going way higher, there's uh, hardware security modules out there that are available that, um, that really take it up kind of to the next level. Um, the, I think, I think for context with this, we can think about, okay, so at the, at the current level of, uh, the, like the maximum computing power that we can, we can leverage the number of years it would take to brute force a 256 bit AES key is about 375 with 48 zeros after it that many years context with that is that astronomers think that in about 5.4 billion years or you know 5.4 with nine zeros after it that's when the sun is going to enter its red giant phase and engulf the earth so the point of this is that brute force is not your primary worry the attackers are really out there they're just looking for your keys 
Yeah, and, and I think, I mean, we talked a lot about handling private keys and, and whatnot, and I, I think that's, um, that's definitely um, everything John said there, I, I, I agree with. I think if you extend that, though, to just secrets in general, because there's a lot of different um, secrets that, um, that have to be stored, um, passwords, private keys, you know, there's, there's a lot of different, um, examples and those are, you know, um, there's lots of different ways to get that done. Um, certainly, you know, storing them locally. I think you also have to consider, um, how you communicate these things. I, I just this week I was, um, you know, working on, uh, deploying an application into the, into the, uh, the Apple app store. And, um, you know, in order to do that for anybody that's done it, it, it involves a lot of keys and certificates and signing and app signing and code signing and all that stuff. Um, anyway, so you, you gotta have a key, um, to do that. And, uh, the, the private key is sort of how you do the app signing, uh, for the submission, but the, there's not a good way. Um, in fact, Apple oddly, uh, doesn't, even provide a way to exchange these keys so that groups of developers that might need to have access um, to these keys can actually exchange them. Um, so, you, you know, you end up with uh, uh, emails and, and various other things. I think there's a lot of consideration has to be given. And as John said, a lot of these cybersecurity frameworks um, speak to these things. But I think a lot of consideration and thought has to be given to how do you uh, not only how do you store these things, but how do you communicate them? How do you communicate them within your company? How do you uh, communicate them when they need to sort of go outside of, uh, of your, uh, of your company? And I think you need to have some, some very, um, specific guidance for your staff, um, on, on how they should do that in your in your environment. It's easy to write sort of these very um, uh, broad rules in the cybersecurity frameworks. Um, you know, your password must be 32 digits, 32 characters long. And, uh, you know, rule number two is don't write it down anywhere. Um, you know, there's, the, 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 but you, you, you still have to operate. Um, so um, I think in your environment, even once you have the cybersecurity framework, you need to have some very specific plans on where do you in your company store these secrets, these private keys, these passwords, these other things. How do you, if you need to communicate within your company, um, a private key, a password, whatever, how do you do that inside of your company? And then thirdly, how do you communicate these private keys, these passwords when you're trying to communicate to, uh, to, a, third, uh, to a third party? Um, and, and, and the answer is going to be, it's going to, uh, vary, you know, by, uh, by the number of people that we have on this, on this, uh, webinar. Um, you know, some folks have, some people do have Google drive. Some people do have Slack. Some people do have, um, Apple messenger or whatever. Um, you know, people, uh, some folks can, you know, can just call one another. The, the key is short enough. The information is is, uh, is short enough to just be able to read it out audibly over the phone. Some people can print it out and stick it in an envelope and mail it. There's a lot of different ways to get there, but what the answer is, is going to depend largely on your environment. And, um, I would, I would encourage folks to come up with a company policy, come up with an enterprise policy, communicate and train on that company policy, and then enforce that company policy as it relates to storage and then communication, uh, communicating both, intercompany communications and intra-company communications of these secrets. And Brian, I know you, you've talked about something kind of related. What's the, what's the, um, the most common mistake you've seen in security uh, in uh, voice networks? Well, I, I, and we don't, I don't think we have enough time to get into all the best practices, but just going back real quick on the passwords, I really, uh, really agree with, with what my colleagues have talked about in terms of keeping the encryption, the authentication, keeping that secure and those passwords. And um, I, I just, I want to underscore the, the awareness of where your secrets are and what secrets you need to protect. Um, there's some interfaces that you never deal with until you really have to deal with it. But if you go ahead and advance and know, hey, 
I've got, I've, my users have passwords. My users have passcodes or PIN numbers that they use for my service. And that's important. And I may also, I may categorize all those things. Maybe there's some things that they use that they don't know about. Like they have a particular phone or a particular device that we manage and we manage it using credentials. There's uh, admin passwords, there's device management, as I mentioned before. Sometimes there's individual service passwords and pins and things that need to be kept track of. And, and then going back to the, the, the things you never use is um, there's a law enforcement interface on any commercially uh, commercial voice platform. Um, and that's having to do with laws and that sort of thing, but protecting the way you access that. Vendors have for years um, issued some of that information on an as need to know basis to particular roles within a company that purchases their system. Well, some of that's gotten a little bit loose, but it's still important to keep track of those privileged super user type um, credentials and know how to, if they do get out, have a practice, know ahead of time, hey, I'm not going to write down what the password is here, but when we need to reset it, this is how we do it. And this is where we can investigate where it's been uh, used without our permission. So having those sorts of plans in advance uh, makes a big difference. And I, I still think to your question, the management of secrets, passwords, passcodes is still a leading, um, uh, a leading vector that can, can involve improvement. Like John said, you know, brute forcing the actual keys used uh, or, or at brute forcing the actual um, ciphers and protocols that is that is a thing that's why we go to tls 1.2 we deprecate certain protocols certain ciphers and we're looking at 1.3 for tls but at the end of the day the most frequent things that i see are just the mismanagement of passwords yeah i think that's where the an audit becomes really, really helpful too. Um, like Brian, you're talking about, we, we build this system, the system has a database. Do we actually know what's in that database and if it's protected? Doing an audit allows us to slow down, kind of stop, put our security hat on and really think critically about what we've just built and is it secure, is it robust? So that's a, that's a really interesting discussion there on TLS management. It, there's a couple of items that come to mind, kind of the most common mistakes. Um, that uh, I do, I spend a lot of time studying how attacks are actually happening in, t in networks today. Um, and uh, in this sort of reading what's disclosed, a lot of times you get really good data from public institutions, government institutions, because they have to do disclosures on root cause analysis. And uh, one of the most common things that continues to show up is failure to segment networks um, so that you've got core servers that are uh, accessible, core key servers and services that are accessible from uh, PCs. Android devices, other devices that are common, common sources of malware. So the, the standard classic attack, the sort of the attack, the recipe book attack on a corporate network today is to send an email to someone, get them to open that email and install malware on a Windows PC, not a Mac, not a Linux machine, a Windows PC. This is you just one of the easiest, cheapest attack. Install it on a Windows machine. And then from there, you connect back to command and control, and then you launch attacks against the internal network. And so it's not that that Windows machine was all that interesting, but you, you use that Windows machine as a platform to break out to the rest of the network. And so the question is, when you have those PCs, those Android devices in the network that are, that are the statistically the most common uh, hosts for malware, then what can those machines reach out and access? And so the questions there are, are your firewalls treating your management PCs, your Windows PCs, et cetera, are they treating them as basically trusted devices and on the same uh, on the same trust level with your with your other network with your servers, or do you have uh, firewall rules in place that isolate and say, well, maybe from this Windows machine we need to SSH into that server, but we don't need to be able to talk talk to all the other ports. Or um, what about when when those machines connect in over VPN? Does the VPN give them a, a blank check to to talk to the rest of the network? That's a that's a a really common mistake. Uh, an another one that I'll put uh, most common mistake is failure to update software regularly. Um, and remove end of life devices. So for example, not pet, you cost billions of dollars in damage. And it was based on folks who had Windows servers that just weren't running the freely available updates. They could have run updates. I know, as we discussed earlier, updates take a lot of work. Uh, there's a risk with updates. You have to do reboots usually uh, to activate the update. 
but um, those those um, those uh, outdated software that is what the attackers are looking for. They're looking for those vulnerabilities, and they use those vulnerabilities to build malware that they can use to to launch their attacks. And so, nearly all of the attacks, including the very expensive attacks, are done using uh, uh, vulnerabilities that have been patched. It's extremely few zero days or or the similar type of um, attacks that are actually used in in real networks. Uh, even the CIA toolkit for attacking Linux machine, it was based on, even at the time it was it was disclosed, um, it was based on attacks that were well-known and passed. And it was basically just expecting that people had not done their Red Hat and Debian updates on their machines. Um, so uh, James, I know you had, you've had some thoughts kind of on this, on this topic too. Yeah, I mean, I think sort of going back to the, the, uh, the failure to update software and, and removing end of life devices, um, It's hard. It's expensive. It there needs to be factored into, though, this is sort of my argument, it needs to be factored into the cost of, of running the network. When you don't, uh, when you continue to support end of life devices, um, and, unless you spend tons of uh, like man time, you know, man hours, woman hours, working on uh, tightening the security of these systems, you end up with uh, sort of f forcing the lowest common denominator. I, I don't, I don't remember who said it, but you know, it, I think the example was, well, if you've, if you've got TLS, you've enabled TLS 1.2, that's a uh, sure one said it, you enable 1.2 and you know, and uh, you don't go back and you disable 1.0 and you look and you've, you know, you've got 50% of your, of your accesses that are still using, you know, 1.0. Um, you know, that, that, that sounds like, well, you know, we can just turn off 1.0. Um, but if you've got devices that only support client devices that only support 1.0, then the introduction of 1.2 doesn't really do much because it forces from an interface perspective, forces you to support sort of the lowest common denominator. So there's lots of different ways to get there. You know, I think Sherwin mentioned separate interfaces um, and, and you can do that. Um, but again, you have to, um, you know, I think Mark said, you know, if you've got, you've got, uh, you know, t two doors to the vault and one of them has, you know, uh, no lock and the other one's, you know, uh, got a, uh, got a nice, uh, nice strong lock on it. Certainly they're not going to, they're not going to get in through the door that has the nice strong lock in it. They're just going to go through the door that's, you know, comparatively um, unlocked. So access to resources through these disparate interfaces has to be um, uh, has to be uh, thought about. I mean, there are um, you know in the voice network we think about device provisioning. You know, we could think about um, an example of how you might think all this uh, you know, all the way through might be well maybe maybe you set up a new physical interface, new virtual interface, new interface on your your um, your load balancer, your you know um, uh, SL, SSL offload device, your you know F5 LTM, you know whatever it is, um, you know for each different provisioning type or for each different phone type, you know that that might be a, a a way to get there. And then you only allow you know phones of this type to go through this interface. Anything with any other user agent won't go through. Anything asking for phones asking for configuration files that don't fall within a certain range. Maybe they, you know, they don't go through and that's going to take time. That's going to take effort, but that's an example of sort of thinking through, you know, what the implication of continuing to support these, these end of life devices um, looks like. Um, if you don't do that, then um, I think you have to, and sometimes you can, you know, especially, Especially in this environment of mergers and acquisitions, if you know you you got a you know hundred thousand users that you just you know bought or merged with, and you know they've you've got a hundred thousand endpoints out there, um, you know certainly there's conversations that have to be had about about what you know what that looks like if you try to you know migrate these devices to uh, to different interfaces. Alternatively, or maybe additionally, because we do. Um, you know, uh, some M&A work um, too, you know, you could during the due diligence 
consider, um, you know, what does that look like before you go buy a hundred thousand users? You know, are they using per device passwords? Are they using TLS 1.0? How many other devices are ancient devices? Things like there's a lot of different ways to sort of get at this problem. Going back to my original thought, the sooner you get started as you're building either new network um, or a new network or new interfaces or new services, the sooner you sort of imagine what it's going to be like, what it might be like if you're wildly successful, you know, not just what have I got to do to get the first guy out there, but you know, what, what am I going to have to do to get the millionth guy on the network? You know, what's it going to look like when I have a million endpoints to deal with? Um, and a million endpoints to upgrade, and a million endpoints to migrate, and a million endpoints to replace, and so on and so forth. Um, and may maybe you don't get all the way to the million, but certainly, you know, you're hoping to get past one. Um, and if you don't get past one, it's largely irrelevant anyway. Um, so, you know, be imaginative. Think about, you know, what is life going to be like at scale? Um, and don't focus so much on what have I got to do to get this first one going. So we're going to take questions. We'd welcome uh, your questions here. We've got a, it's a, actually an impressive number of you have uh, been able to stay. The vast majority of you have been able to stay past the top of the hour. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Thanks for those questions. Um, so you can use the chat function to bring us those questions here. You can send it to uh, us as panelists, and I'll, I'll bring those to the group. We're going to start with a, a question from Fred. Um, about uh, questions about shaken and, and stir, so we can think of robocalling as an element of security. We're trying to prevent people's phones from ringing when they ought not ring. Um, so, do you guys have some sense for um, thoughts on that? Uh, how much? How do you think it will actually help the telephony industry? Uh, do you think it's really going to cut down on spam calls? What what kind of impact do you think uh, these protocols are going to have? Well, I mean, I, I I guess I'll jump in there first, and then and then let others. Um add their thoughts in, but certainly the, the, the shaken and stir, um, 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 I was going to say standard, but it's not really a standard yet, but, uh, you know, the, the shaken and stir software, those approaches, um, they'll, they will, they will have, they will provide some improvement. Um, I think those things along with the serious view that, uh, that the, the federal law enforcement has taken as of late, um, with some of these spam things and the, the teeth that's been put into some of these, uh, some of these sort of completely non-technical um, uh, solutions, um, really, uh, really will help. Um, I feel like we we um, we need a solution. I feel like if we don't come up with a solution to robocalling, then it really does put the traditional telephone industry with sort of the a, a public directory style approach. Um, in peril. Um, I don't know that it'll affect the WebExes of the world or the Zooms of the world or the, uh, you know, whomever, um, Office 365, they changed their name, whatever it is now. Um, you know, those, those things, I don't, I don't think it puts them in peril because those are closed directories and, 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 and whatnot. You, you sort of, you have more guarantees on who's calling you um, and when and, and all of that sort of fun. But the open directory, the public approach, I think it's in peril if we don't come up with solutions to this rebel calling. And I think shaking and stir is a good start. I'm eager to see just how pervasive the trust is of the authority that's, that's being developed to handle, handle the, um, uh, the trust factor. So um, I think those that are early in, have uh, made a lot of progress in setting things up, but with the government mandate of all service providers being able to do it, I'm, I'm interested to see how much of a, um, how much of a burden it becomes on the smaller service providers that, and if it's going to push more mergers and acquisitions in order to be compliant, it may feel some other things in way of getting that secure, that minimum security to a point where, uh, people are willing to buy from a company that can participate versus one that's not compliant and looks like a fly-by-night oper operation, even if they were the original incumbent, um, right. just simply because they haven't done their due diligence to get their security posture right. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see just how, how secure that the authority works out. 
Yeah, I, I kind of have a theory that the uh, federal level and the other governments, the Canadian government's already regulated some other governments, but they're mostly in kind of world zone one sort of in our, in our hemisphere that's um, mandating shake and stir. I kind of have a theory that um, they're putting attention on it, they're passing laws, they're requiring it, but it, it's a little bit like the development of um, seatbelts in cars. They mandated the cars had seatbelts. I'm not an expert on transportation safety, but they mandated the cars had seatbelts uh, at some <coughs> point that they would be available. And that uh, a lot of people didn't like seatbelts, so the car manufacturers started working on alternate technologies, and so they developed uh, airbags as well. And they developed other kind of arming, like because people really don't like wearing seatbelts. How do we protect the people who don't really want to wear a seatbelt? Well, airbags were actually one of the answers to that. Well, fast forward 30 years now, and what we have is both seatbelts and airbags, and our cars are safer than they've ever been. Um, I'm, what I'm hoping is that in, in telephony, we're going to see, well, shake and stir, yeah, that's one thing that was mandated, but that got everybody focused in the right direction. And so the vendors started saying, well, you know, shake and stir, that's a, that's a good start. We, we have to do that in some sort of way, but that really only kind of moves the ball a little bit. And, but there's this other thing we can do. We can do this other, we can use other intelligence to determine whether these calls are likely to be harassing. And I think we're seeing some signs of this where in networks that actually don't support shake and stir yet, we're actually seeing a, a pretty substantial reduction in robocalling. For example, within the AT&T mobility network, not just calls from AT&T mobility to AT&T mobility, but also calls coming in from the PSEN. There's been a marked reduction in uh, in robocalling uh, traffic because they, they've uh, embraced their ability to block calls They've uh, and they've they've started putting other tools in place to identify and label you know, potentially um, um, nuisance calls, and so that's it's basically it's turned the gaze of the developers and of the innovators, and I think some of what what it took was the regulators putting some um, putting some tools uh, there in place. There's a couple of sad things though about shake and stir that are really necessary to make it go. Uh, right now, there are rules at the federal level that make it more expensive for American rural providers, incumbents, uh, independents to uh, to operate over SIP than over SSM and TDM. And so they're actually discouraged from using SIP, which means that they are encouraged, in effect, to not use Shake and Stir, even though the law mandates that they implement something like Shake and Stir. So there's some rationalization that needs to happen, and these things need to be lined up to make this work. So there's out of band Shake and Stir. I feel like a much more obvious answer Though, uh, although out of band shake and stir is, is kind of a nice idea, um, the a much more obvious answer is modify those rules to encourage uh, SIP interconnection for in, instead of uh, TDM and SS7 interconnection. And that would open up the door to use uh, shake and stir. It would also cause another round of innovation in the telecom industry because right now we have a lot, uh, there's actually a lot of TDM still being operated because of those legacy rules. Uh, I, I believe, I'm not a, a lawyer, but I, I believe these are rules that are basically. Uh, some rules from the FTC, some rules from the FCC uh, that are that are at play here. We've got another question that came in from Russ. Um, so if you're doing voice across the internet, uh, what, if anything, is safe to send via the internet without encryption? Um, well, I, I guess that's sort of you know, in the uh, safe is the in the eye of the beholder, right? The de depends on depends on on what you're on what you're doing. If you're a if you're a hospital or you're you know you're required to you know to comply with with HIPAA or a you know a, or any other uh, you know security uh, framework um, for protection of of PII, and you're likely to have PII as, as content, uh, even audio content, then it really needs to be, uh, it really needs to be encrypted end to end. Um, you know, if you're, uh, and that's, that's a very extreme example where, you know, where they have, they actually have your, uh, uh, they have laws that sort of mandate that, but, uh, you know, if you're a, if you're an insurance company, if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you're a, um, you know, a, a, a dentist, if you're, a, you know, if you're likely to deal with people's PII and um, not excited about the fact that uh, if it became known, if some of that PII became known because they, you know, they interacted with you, um, uh, 
then you know it it needs to be it needs to be encrypted and i would say uh, i would say tls and and uh srtp are are warranted yeah i would i would second the end to end part of that because i i think about this and i mean this is a legit question for everyone here i think is it really safer like why why single out the internet the public internet is it really safer to send unencrypted traffic over private links than over public links when we're talking about somebody listening to someone else's phone calls that's what we're trying to avoid right or getting metadata that can be exploited and used that so I, you'd, I really so wrestle I think with John, that. you'd have to define what what do you mean by private links <sighs> Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking MPLS links. Uh, I'm thinking Smart WAN or you know, a, a, like a Velo Cloud. Um, yeah, I mean, any any of those. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think I think we really, you know, we this is sort of where where John is going. You know, I, in a in a um, in a life a long distance a long time ago. You know, we used to um, have to like regularly when selling VoIP, you know, have make that argument that, you know, no VoIP's not as, it's not as, um, as insecure as, as, um, as people make it out like it is. Um, and, and it, and it's, it's not that it's not, it's not that it's secure. I'm not trying to make that, that case. Um, but, you know, people sort of forget that really, you know, with a, uh, with a $19 butt set from the local Best Buy, um, you know, you can walk down the street and at any one of those little uh, green AT&T Bell South things, look at, uh, listen to a number of, uh, of different uh, phone calls, completely un, unencrypted. Um, and yeah, I mean, it does require an understanding of, of uh, a little bit of, a little bit of electronics, um, but, but not a lot. Um, and you know you can you can listen to those same phone calls on uh, on a on a voice network with um, you know um, as Fred has uh, pointed out um, at least to the panelists um, you know with uh, with simple Wireshark um, which is which is absolutely true um, I I don't think the argument I don't think the question is um, is VoIP more or less insecure than traditional telephone service. Um, I would say no, they're about, they're about the same from a security perspective. Um, you mean unencrypted VoIP? Um, unencrypted VoIP and, and, and standard telephone service, yeah. uh, POTS. Uh, no, they're, they're about the same, but I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't like that. I, I think we can do, we can, without a lot of hassle, honestly, um, can do better than that. Um, and it, it ought to be, it ought to be encrypted with TLS um, and SRTP um, end to end, and yes, that does create some hassle for um, for um, you know, for operators, um, you know, doing a lot of the things that they're you know that they're required to do on a on a day to day basis. But it, I still think it needs to be done, um, and so certainly on one of the large customers that I work with. Um, uh, when they're when they're dealing with their you know twenty five thousand phones on campus, they you know they they do not use TLS and SRTP um, in that they believe they have physical security. Um, you know their routers and their switches and their cables are either buried underground or in locked closets and so on and so forth. So they they feel like they have physical security uh, on on grounds. Um, but any anything that comes in from the PSTN, I'm sorry, from the public internet, um, requires uh, TLS and SRTP, and those are the only those are the interfaces that are that are open. So when we do soft clients, um, you know, whether it be um, UC Connect or or whatever, um, um, or when they have a phone uh, that's taken home, especially during this COVID nineteen stuff, they've got a lot of phones that have gone remote. Um, but they they all use TLS and SRTP. Um, it's the only way to get in, and I, I think I think that's a good decision. Yeah, I mean, it seems like if and I don't have a lot, I don't have any real real world data on statistics on this, but if you it seems like if you're going to try to 
listen to executive A's phone call. You're going to go to executive A's office, get in the closet, and you're going to listen on their land. Right. You're not going to find that phone call on the public internet. You're not going to find that. And so, and so in that scenario, a, a private MPLS link doesn't do you any good, doesn't protect you at all. Even an encrypted IPsec tunnel doesn't do you any good because you are likely on the other side of the, uh, the device that's terminating that TLS connection or that IPsec connection. And so maybe that, that's what it brings it back around to what you, James, you mentioned a couple times is end-to-end -end encryption really is the answer rather than, and, and, and I bring that up, kind of stir the pot a little bit, but then also to make sure that we're not sitting here thinking that, that the easy answer is a private link or the easy answer is an IPsec tunnel um, from SPC to the, you know, the site. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, so what you're, you guys are sort of talking uh, about a little bit is defining who your who your enemy is. You know, who are you mm -hmm. trying to defend against? And if the if the attacker is actively uh, trying to, um, for example, do the corporate espionage case that you you described, John, then they're going to attack that weak spot. If, and if you enable that unencrypted communication, then you're creating that that point for them to attack. They're not gonna necessarily going to go attack the up at the upstream router link. Uh, but they're going to attack it within the, the the local network more directly. So another question uh, for the panel is uh, for uh, device management, uh, such as SIP phones, uh, software that downloads, you know, the apps that download um, on, on uh, iPhones, for example, but primarily for devices, um, is mutual TLS really the only safe way to provide those configurations? Uh, to the uh, to those devices is that really the only game in town and is there any kind of risk uh, in considering a bulletproof is there a way to do mutual TLS client certificate authentication incorrectly so that well we're using mutual TLS but we're we really have su substantial gaps when we use it you can forget to turn off the old non mutual TLS protected interface you leave that old interface enabled we've heard that theme come up a couple of times oh, yeah. right so I, I wouldn't i mean i don't know that i'd go so far as to say it's the only way i would argue that it is my preferred way again for green greenfield installations um you know mutual tls gives you a way to um to end up with sort of per device security um that's um, that's certainly more secure and easier to do than handing out individual device, you know, login names and password. That said, though, that um, depends on the uh, the the um, manufacturer of the endpoints having uh, uh, certificates that are signed and private keys that, per Brian's conversation, didn't end up in some backup and on the internet someplace. Um, you know, that you can trust the, you know, you can trust the CA, um, which in this case is often going to be the, the manufacturer. Now, not, not every manufacturer, I'm thinking Polycom specifically, Yealink does the same thing. Um, not every manufacturer does that. Some manufacturers that support mutual TLS, you actually do, you have to load your own CA and your own certificate in order to, in order to make it work. And certainly you can do that with Polycoms too, and I assume Yealink. Um, but you know that that certainly um, makes it more difficult um, to, from a provisioning perspective on a per phone basis. But um, I, I think, I mean, I, I really like mutual TLS. It, it gives you a lot of a lot of flexibility. Um, the uh, there's 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 especially in, a, in the Polycom case, in the Yealink case, there's data that's in those certificates that you should have a fair amount of confidence you can trust that's a duplicate of what's in the SIP that we've already decided you can't trust. So um, I, I, I like, I mean, I, I, I like that at least for now, um, the mutual TLS that's afforded you by, for, by, for default in, in Polycoms and, and Yale links and, and numerous others, but you know, those are the, those are the line share. Um, I, I think 
I think that does make per device security um, far better. And easier and cheaper. Other thoughts on device protection and, and or mutual TLS. I heard James say that while mutual TLS is his preference, he, he wouldn't say it's the necessarily the only uh, only way to do it, you know, if you if you have to. Other thoughts on this area? That's for device provisioning. Do you guys think that it is worth it to move towards mutual TLS for phone calls? So that would be a case where the, for example, the session border controller to which the uh, SIP device registers would, um, it would check the certificate of the TLS connection. Is that what you're- So the SEC would check the certificate of the phone in that TLS connection as well. Yeah, yeah, I think, well, James kind of alluded to that. We're saying basically that the, the, um, the, the data in the TLS certificate has been signed with the certificate you trust the data in the SIP header is not, uh, it's, you know, it's not really uh, naturally trustworthy. And so being able to sort of align those, I, I think it's a, um, uh, it's a good thing. I think it's, it's relatively uh, rare to deploy it. So I think there's some stuff to be learned um, because it hasn't been uh, deployed at scale um, widely, but it seems like, I, I know that some service providers have done it, for example, TDS Telecom, um, was has been doing it that way for a, a long time. They've used that that kind of architecture for uh, session border controller registration on MetaSwitch perimeter, um, and I, I think it was Polycom and Adtran. Um, but uh, so it, it can be done. There are there are proof cases that it's a that it's a good idea. It does seem like a wise uh, wise technology. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time for today. Last, uh, last comments from everyone. I'll give you a chance. Um, any, anything that has come to mind that you really won't want to, uh, to reiterate um, as, we, uh, as we wrap up today? Um, I mean, I guess I would <clears throat> sort of three, three thoughts. Uh, first, answer for its question. Yeah, I mean, I think the non-default stuff, you know, not using defaults is, is basically what we're arguing for. Uh, certainly that applies to endpoints, but it also applies to switches and routers and firewalls and, and all of those those sorts of things. Any security framework that you would use sort of the, you know, right after the the, uh, the question on well, what devices are you using, the very next question is going to be, and did you turn off all the default, you know, passwords? Are you making sure that you changed all those things? So, so yeah, I would, I would, uh, I would say, yeah, the, the just sort of as a matter of course, step one, unbox device, step two, disable default password, um, sort of universally, um, uh, whether it be, you know, uh, a, a CPE device, whether it be something in the core, whether it be something in your house, uh, it, it almost doesn't matter where it's at, uh, disable default password. Um, the... Um, I guess you know. Thanks to everybody that that came. Thanks to everybody that uh, that stuck uh, stuck around. If you if you heard something that piqued your curiosity and you have other questions, um, certainly uh, reach out to the account team. I'm happy to take your phone call, take your emails. Um, uh, we can certainly set up calls to 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 uh, to chat about uh, um, you know whatever you uh, want to uh, to chat about as it, as it relates to this stuff. But, but lastly, I would encourage, um, be imaginative, you know, um, um, you know, failure of imagination really, I think does cause a lot of, a lot of issues. You need to imagine again, what your network would look like at scale. Imagine how are the bad guys going to try to again, get in, imagine what's going to, how are you going to upgrade these things when upgrades come about? How are you going to, you know, dip, get rid of these old devices when they need to be replaced? How are you going to, I mean, uh, you, these are these are things that they they're problems that occur after the fact, but they need to be factored into the initial design so that they can be more readily addressed when they actually do uh, when they do come about. So I think you know, imagining what it's going to look like in a year or two or ten or you know, in a hundred users or a thousand users or you know, a million users, but uh, both of those exercises. I think will 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 help um, inform current decisions and provide for long term better engineering. Any last words? Turn the old stuff off. Turn the old stuff off. Definitely. Guard those secrets. 
Great. Well, thanks for coming to our webinar. We appreciate uh, you for uh, making this time to, uh, to come. The questions that uh, several of you sent in, we really appreciate that. Uh, once you leave here, I hope you'll be willing to do a survey to help us kind of improve for next time and uh, tell us how we can tweak this and make this more useful to you. Um, we uh, Thanks for uh, your interest and uh, please check out the CSAN service, the uh, cybersecurity assessment and defense uh, service that we're offering um, to make these kind of uh, implementations and evaluations of your network just kind of an everyday thing that you don't have to do yourself that we can, we can help you with.